Welcome to Computer Science 320, 2014 Winter 2's Midterm 1 Practice Problems. We are on Problem 5, Part 2. So here's the problem. In each row below, so we've got one, two, three rows that you can see, and there's a couple more rows down below. We're going to circle the correct statement if we know that for all positive integers n, there are two larger integers n1 and n2, such that f of n1 is less than g of n1, and f of n2 is greater than g of n2. So that's what we know. We know all of this. And we're supposed to say things like, is f of n in big O of g of n? Is f of n in big omega of g of n? Is f of n in big theta? And what remains is to talk about little o and little omega. So we know there's two larger integers than any given integer, such that for one of those values, g is larger, and for one of those values, f is larger. So, you know, roughly speaking, what this means is that these functions keep crossing and recrossing off to infinity. Uh, there, there's never one that is uh, completely dominant over the other one uh, in the sense that it is strictly larger. Now, uh, one thing that this does not necessarily mean is that we don't have a relationship between them. So a good way to try out something like this would be to see if you can create a function um, that's actually really easy to analyze, uh, but that has this property. And, and the first thing that occurs to me is, um, you know, we can, we can easily make a function that looks like this, right? That's a sine function. And another function that just looks like this, that's a constant function. So we could have f of n be equal to, say, 2 to give ourselves some room, and g of n to be equal to uh, 2 plus sine of n. And then this, these two are going to oscillate around each other all the way off to infinity. But this one's never going to get any bigger than 3, and it's never going to get any smaller than 1. So these two are actually theta of each other, right? We can ignore this sine term here. It doesn't have a big effect asymptotically. So, um, so it's not that, that these things have no relationship to each other. They can have a relationship. So by the way, at this point, uh, we know for sure that this answer is not correct. It is not the case that we know f is not in big theta of g, because we just gave an example where f is in big theta of g. And because big theta is both big O and big omega, we, we also know these answers are incorrect. We don't know that f is not in big O of g. We don't know that f is not in big omega of g. Okay, do we know that f is in big O of g? Uh, here we run into the same sort of problem with these oscillating functions, right? So we could have, say, a linear function, and we could have something like, in fact, uh, we could have something like the weird algorithm that we looked at earlier in this sequence of videos, where it's constant for an infinite number of values, and then for a few values, a few in the sense of they're, they're scattered throughout this infinite number of values, but they are themselves infinite, where it behaves differently. So we can have it be you know mostly constant, but occasionally it goes up to linear. Okay, so this is not uh, in big omega. Uh, it is in big O. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to make it go a little bit larger to be able to suit our property because they have to actually cross. So we've got something that is in big O and is not in big omega. Um, so, you know, is it necessarily in uh, big omega? Uh, no. It's not necessarily in big omega. Uh, I, by the way, you might look at this and say, oh, well, that's not in big O. It's not upper bounded. Well, I can multiply this line by a constant and make it an upper bound. So remember, these are asymptotic upper bounds. An upper bound does not necessarily have to be always larger than the thing that it's bounding. Uh, this is a bit of a digression, but if we compare n and n plus 1, is n an asymptotic upper bound on n plus 1? Well, sure, plus one's just a low order term, right? So this is in theta of n. It's both an asymptotic upper and lower bound. But n plus one is always greater than n for every possible value of n. Nonetheless, n is an asymptotic upper bound, and that's okay. All right, uh, so we can, we can give the reverse example to the one where we just gave. We can have f play the role of the oscillating function and g play the role of the line instead, and we'll be able to cross out this example too. We'll have something that's not a big O bound, something that's not a big omega bound. So we don't know if it's in big O. We don't know if it's in big omega. Because we can eliminate these, we can also eliminate big theta. We don't know 
if it's in big theta. So we actually don't know for sure for any of these. We have left to consider little o and little omega. Now, the requirements for little o and little omega are stronger. So for f of n to be an element of little o of g of n, it has to be the case that no matter what constant you multiply g by, if n gets large enough, uh, f of n is always less than or equal to g of n. Uh, can we get that with these sorts of functions? And the answer is no, we can't. Because if there's always some points where g of n is smaller than f of n, and we have that up here, there are always some points, right? There's the f of n1 is less than g of n1, but the f of n2 is greater than g of n2. So they're going to cross. If there's always points where they cross, then that statement's not going to be true. If, for example, we can just pick one as our constant, and then we're just comparing f of n directly against g of n. And we know for sure that no matter what n you pick, that comparison flip-flops back and forth. So in fact, we know f of n can't be little o of g of n. And by exactly the same argument, but reversing the roles of f and g, we know f of n can't be an element of little omega of g of n. Remember, little o and little omega, they are exactly symmetrical, just like big O and big omega are exactly symmetrical. So we know for our first three bounds, our big bounds, uh, f of n could be big O of g of n, f of n could be big omega of g of n, f of n could be big theta of g of n, but it doesn't have to be any of those things. And for these little o bounds, because they keep crossing and recrossing, no, they can't be little o bounded. Next up, we will work on the next part of this problem.